Hey, welcome to Behind the Mic Conversations of Hope. Well, on November 1st, just a week before the midterm elections, I sat down with Anne Graham Lotz. Anne is the daughter of Reverend Billy Graham. She is the founder of Angel Ministries and is the author of 11 books, including Just Give Me Jesus. I asked Anne to join us so we could hear from her about the state of our nation from a biblical worldview. In our Pledge of Allegiance, we recite one nation under God, but are we really still one nation under God? Or have we forgotten about God or turned our back on Him? We also pledge that these United States are indivisible, yet this nation is perhaps more divided than it has been in decades. Where have we gone and where are we headed? And what does God have to say about the United States of America? Look, whether you're Republican or Democrat, far left, far right, or somewhere in between, this conversation with Ann Graham Lotz is one that all Americans need to hear. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've likely wondered, as I have, how do I navigate the politics of our country while still adhering to God's word and his instruction? Well, I hope that you'll prayerfully listen to this conversation of hope with Ann Graham Lotz to gain some insight into that very question. Well, thank you for joining us again on Behind the Mic Conversations of Hope. My name is Mike Stone. I'm your host, and I am, uh, I don't know the words to express uh, my honor uh, for having our guest on today, Ann Graham Lotz. Uh, Ann, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm I'm so glad to be with you, Mike. Thank you for asking me. Absolutely. And and I am so grateful, too. You You are getting over COVID, and man... I feel it terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are you are working overtime here, and I'm so grateful. We're we're gonna uh, make this as easy as possible. But um, you know, when I when I think of the Graham family, uh, we see pictures uh, of you all growing up, and you're always in your dress, and and the, the boys are always dressed up nice. And I just picture them, you all sitting at the table and obeying, and never having problems. Um, was it that way? <laughs> you know, I remember Dr. Robert Schuler interviewing me once at the Crystal Cathedral, and he said, you know, in his very preacher's voice, Anne, what was it like when you got up in the morning in Billy Graham's household, and uh, what's the first thing you did? And I said, Dr. Schuler, the first thing we did was fight. You know, we were a very <laughs> rambunctious group, and um, we fought with each other. But the interesting thing is Mother trained us when people attacked from outside, we all banded together and then um, were very uh, protective of each other. So, yeah. um, so we were a very scrappy bunch. So we, we were not uh, those those pictures that you see of us all dressed up. That was for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just a normal person, just like the rest of us, fighting with our siblings. Well, I've got to I've got to tell you the first thing I noticed um, when I started researching you, which. You know, I thought I knew you, but boy, I learned a lot more about you online. Your father, I mean, I can't even imagine this, but your father, Dr. Billy Graham, called you the best preacher in the family. Um, now, we, I think we all know uh, your brother, Franklin Graham, who's the, the president and CEO of Samaritan's Purse, and, and we're all gearing up for Operation Christmas Child right now. But just between you and me... Did you rub that in a little bit when your dad told you that you were the best preacher in the family? Did you walk up to, uh, to an elbow Franklin? <laughs> I, I have never elbowed Franklin because we're not in competition, Mike. You know? That's right. And my father, that was a statement he made to 60 Minutes when they were doing a profile on me. And, and I believe it was my father's way of just giving me his blessing because there was, mm. there is, has been, will be pushback because... Uh, I stand in the pulpit and I speak to whoever is in front of me. It can be an all-male audience. It can be male and female. It can be all women. I just, you know, but there's some people that don't accept that. And so my father was just putting his hand on my shoulder and saying that I had his blessing. Um, And and to be honest, Mike, uh, in all of human history, other than in the Old Testament, maybe Elijah, and in the New Testament, maybe uh, the Apostle Paul, no one is a better preacher than my father. If you judge the response to the preaching, the response to the gospel, um, my father hands down is just in a a category all by himself. So 
but we're not in competition. There's not comparison. We're just each one doing what God's called us to do. And I'm very proud of my brother Franklin. I, I am saying that in jest just to make sure everybody knows, but uh, I, you know, I have to agree. I, I remember even as a child watching Billy Graham Crusades on TV and seeing these stadiums jam packed full of people and rushing to the altars. And it did something to me as, as a 10 year old, 12 year old boy um, to see the response to the gospel in that way. Um, and that's kind of what I, I want to, like you know, just very moving. Yeah. Yeah, just unbelievable. And I, so I want to get into the topic today, which um, I've, en- I've entitled it A Nation Under God in Crisis. And I really want to hear from you because you've seen this um, from probably a different perspective than some of us. Um, a week from today is midterm elections. And over the past several years, we've seen, in my opinion, a country out of control. Um, We're having serious discussions even uh, between intelligent people about the definition of a woman. It's getting to the point where it's almost becoming, uh, you don't know if it's a joke or if it's really, uh, I I guess I would just call it evil. But um, my question to you is, you you recently spoke at the the Family uh, Family Research Council Pray, Vote, and Stand Summit in Atlanta. Um, It was there that you compared the United States to the nation of Judah can you share your thoughts on that with us? Uh, yes, I'd be glad to, because I feel it holds one of the keys to the solution to our nation's issues. And I was speaking from Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, it's interesting, I didn't point this out in Atlanta, but that took place, uh, Isaiah's experience in chapter 6 took place the year that Rome was founded. So the greatest empire that the world may be, one of the greatest empires the world has ever seen, the Roman Empire was founded that year, but no mention of it is made in Scripture. But an entire chapter is devoted to one man's experience of personal revival. And Isaiah experienced personal revival when his nation, Judah, was uh, plunging into moral and spiritual bankruptcy. And um, uh, uh, Israel, uh, Judah, was in crisis. Um, And at that moment in time, Isaiah, instead of wringing his hands, instead of pointing his finger at others, instead of, um, you know, complaining or crawling up in a ball and going back to bed, instead he looked up. And when he looked up, he saw the Lord. And Jesus said in John's gospel that the the Lord that Isaiah saw was a vision of the pre-incarnate Son of God. That was Jesus that he saw seated on the throne. And I just went through the vision that Isaiah had. And as a result of seeing Jesus and having that fresh vision of the power, the authority, the glory, the majesty of Jesus, Isaiah responded and said, woe is me. And he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And what happened was that the vision of who Jesus is uh, brought Isaiah to a realization of who he was in God's sight. And, And I studied Isaiah chapters 1 to 5, I didn't see that Isaiah, I couldn't see his sinfulness. And he was a prophet. He spoke with his lips. I didn't see that his lips were sinful. But but he was convicted of being a man of unclean lips and being no different than the people that were surrounding him. And as a result, as he confessed, and with that would be repentance, then an angel came from the altar and brought a, a live coal, which would be like a burning cold. He pressed it on Isaiah's lips. Uh, and I can tell you <laughs> that that hurt. So uh, Isaiah's lips blistered. I bet you never spoke the same again. But the angel said this, that um, but with this burning coal, he said, your sin is atoned for and your guilt is taken away. And, and the only place that can take place is at the cross. So that's an Old Testament picture of uh, confession of sin, deep repentance, coming to the cross, being cleansed, and then as a result, Isaiah said, um, you know, here am I. When, when God said, and he overheard God saying, um, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And, and God sent him out into a nation that was provoking God's judgment. And the interesting thing, Mike, is that Isaiah, a man who experienced personal revival, never really was able to bring revival to his nation. So his nation plunged right on into judgment. And God told him, the people's response didn't make any difference that he was going to go to a people 
who had eyes but didn't see, ears that didn't hear, that would not respond. But that he and so Isaiah said, "Well, how long do I have to do this?" And basically, God said, "You know, as long as you have breath, or until judgment falls." And and so I, f- I was likening that to what's taking place in America, because I believe first of all, the church, those who call themselves by God's name, we need a fresh vision of Jesus. We need to see a fresh vision of his glory and his holiness and his righteousness and his justice. We need to see ourselves in this sin in our own lives. We keep pointing our finger at others, and it's so easy to do, Mike. I look at the news. I can hardly watch and listen to the news. I get the headlines, but but what's taking place? Um, Not sure when your podcast will be, but yesterday was Halloween uh, from when we're recording this, and the things that took place on Halloween are jaw-dropping, the, the blasphemy, the obscenity, the um, uh, it's just stunning. And, um, and so I, I look at all of that, and I think this is a time for God's people mm-hmm. to look up and to have a fresh vision of Jesus to remember who is our Lord, who is our King, who holds the answers, but first of all, to look into ourselves and ask Him, what do we need to turn from? Because we're promised that if God's people call by God's names, humble themselves, pray, seek His face, and turn from our wicked ways, then He'll forgive, He'll hear our prayer, He'll forgive our sin, and He will heal America. So the fact that America is so not healed, I I put that right at the door of you know, those who call themselves by God's name. It's time for us to return to God in deep contrition and repentance. And Joel chapter 2 says, if we do, who knows, but even at this late date, God would return and bless us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, that is also the cry of my heart. Um, we, We see things that were largely unacceptable to even talk about just 30, 40 years ago. Um, now be in the center of highly charged conflict in our nation. What do you have to say about those kinds of things? I'm talking about like abortion, homosexuality, even gender dysphoria. Um, as believers, how do we how do we grab, grasp that? How do we how do we function in a society that is fighting over those types of things? Um, you know, I don't think we need to fight. We need to stand, and we stand on the truth. And the truth is God's word, which does not change. The Bible says it's forever settled in heaven. Jesus said not one jot or tittle would pass away until all would be fulfilled. So if you go back to the beginning of Genesis, God created us male and female. He makes no mistakes. And God uh, gave Eve to Adam and said, you know, they would be bone of bone, flesh of flesh. That those whom God puts together, let no man put asunder. Jesus affirmed. Uh, what we now call traditional marriage between man and wife in the New Testament when he was asked by divo- about divorce, and he just affirmed marriage. And, um, and the fact that God is the creator, uh, that we did not evolve, we did not come from some little prehistoric blob in some you know, pool out in the whatever. We were created by God for a purpose. We will be held accountable by God for the way we live our lives and the way we receive his Son. So our lives are not cosmic accidents. Our lives have eternal meaning. And so there's a lot that goes into that. And I don't believe we have to fight. I do believe with all my heart that we need to vote. I voted yesterday Mm -hmm. and voted my biblical values and made sure that I was um, researched and up on every, you know, all the people that I needed to vote for and uh, and I do believe that's our civic duty. It's our privilege as American citizens to vote and to stand. That's why I went to Atlanta to, to you know, to stand and to pray and to vote. It's just, it's. Um, we don't want to relinquish that right. At the same yeah. time, I think it's a time to take a stand on the truth and not back down. So, um, so we don't have to be obnoxious. We don't have to be belligerent. We don't have to be confrontational. But we need to take a stand. Uh, so the yeah, so the podcast, uh, this recording will come out on November fourteenth. So it will be after the election. Um, you know, I, I think about uh, going back to uh, reading your Bible in school, being attacked in prayer, being attacked in school, and even the Pledge of Allegiance just not too long ago. 
there was a, a teacher who wanted her class to um, pledge allegiance to the pride flag. And um, has, has America recently started to reject God? Growing up in the 70s, it seemed like every family went to church. You know, every, everything was reasonably calm in our country. Um, has, has America recently started to re- reject God, or has it always been there and it's just being realized? What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, sin has always been there. You know, Satan has always been there. Pride has always been there. Rebellion has been there since the Garden of Eden. So there's nothing really new to that. But in America, you know, I grew up in the 60s, actually. And so when I went to, I went to public school, um, and we had prayer and Bible reading in the school. And, uh, and then they said we couldn't do that as uh, in the classroom, so we moved it to early morning on Thursdays. It was sponsored by the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and we had about 800 kids that would show up for prayer and Bible reading wow. in the, the assembly room. And, um, and so um, I think you know, behind all of this, Mike, is not Democrat or Republican. It's not liberal or conservative. Behind all of this is Satan himself who hates God, hates his people, wants to destroy as many of the people that he can because he knows God loves the whole world, so he's wanting to destroy us. And and he began in the 60s, and I believe he was in back of it, but he's used people to, to accomplish his ends sure. and to remove prayer and Bible reading. And, and then that just gradually led in that same decade to um, abortion, and then that you just see the, it's almost like dominoes. Mm-hmm. And I believe in the last um, decade anyway, maybe less than that, it's been like an avalanche. Um, and, and, I, and I will say this, that I think when you distance yourself from the truth, when you distance yourself from the Word of God, then, then something has to fill that void. And... Romans 1 indicates that when you back away from God, you refuse to acknowledge Him as Creator, you refuse to thank Him, uh, you turn to, you know, evolution, four-footed beasts, and, and substitute something for the Creator, and then you begin this downward spiral of sin, and each, each step of that sin you refuse to repent, you refuse to return to God, in the end, He turns you over to what He's called a, a reprobate mind, which means that you no longer think straight. Yeah. And so a lot of these people that are now in leadership positions, um, they're not thinking straight. And in a sense, I can't blame them because they have no fear of God. So they have not even the beginning of wisdom. They're operating according to their own common sense, which is foolishness, according to what God's, God's wisdom and God's truth is. And, and so we're, we're living at a very... Um, I agree with you, we're a nation in crisis. I'm not sure we're a nation under God anymore. I believe he's backed away, and he's allowed us to just live according to our own devices, um, which is what we're seeing as our nation is crumbling. We have forsaken that foundation of faith in the one true living God. Uh, we've, we've forsaken the truth, and, and in its place, we've substituted our own thoughts, our own philosophies, our own boutique religions, our own, um, you know, what we call common sense or contemporary wisdom, and it's all foolishness. And I would like to ask our leadership in America, how is it working for you? You know, our inflation is out of control, gas prices soaring, we're being invaded at the southern border, we're fighting on the streets, people killing each other, there's a political polarization, and you can blame it on whatever, but it's, it's just... It's an absolute chaotic mess. And I believe it goes right back to the fact that we've forsaken the God of our fathers. We've forsaken that foundation of faith that our forefathers laid so carefully as they um, founded this nation. And the only solution, yes, we need to vote and vote your biblical values, but the only solution, I believe, if, if we're under God's judgment, if he has backed away, the only solution is to repent of our sin, return to God, and ask Him, please, to return to us as a nation. Yeah. 
you know, we've done uh, several podcasts uh, just recently. In fact, uh, we just ended a, a series on pornography. Um, I, I work at an organization called Covenant Eyes, and it was not until I started working there that I realized the depth of the problem with pornography in our country, just that one issue alone, and how it is, ha- has such tremendous infiltration into the church. And one comment was made by one of our staff members that said, you know, if, if you're regularly looking at pornography, are you going to feel like you can stand up um, about things like you were just talking about? Can we stand firm on that foundation of God if we are filling our minds with all that garbage? And the answer is no. We've, we've seen men walk away from their rightful place as spiritual leaders of the, of the household. Um, we've, we see women that are, are being bound in this. Uh, again, that's just one single topic and I think it's it's that slow fade that has happened over the years. And now you said, I, I, I love the, the term you used as avalanche, and it really has been. It's just been an avalanche of not one or two things. It's just been everything coming at us at one time. Um, well, you know, Mike, I appreciate um, what the Pope recently said about that. And uh, he was warning his priests about pornography because he was accurate when he said it lets the devil in and it just yeah. destroys your spirit. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, I was speaking to um, a seminary president, president of a very prestigious seminary, evangelical seminary in this country. He said the number one problem with his students was pornography and they would get into it on the computers back in the stacks of a library where they thought nobody knew what they were doing and they were saturating themselves in pornography. And I'll tell you that that could be one huge reason the the church has no power today because um, the church at Thyatira, our Lord's letter to them in Revelation, he, he links sexual purity with spiritual power and that if you repent of your immorality, then he said you'll have authority over the nations. If you don't repent, if you don't turn away from immorality, then the implication is that you know, you're impotent spiritually. Yeah. You have no power to make an impact. So um, pornography is like a, a black, that black mold. I think of New Orleans recovery, or even now in Florida, you know, and yeah. uh, other places where there's been flooding and they have to rip out the walls, they have to rip out the interior of the homes because that black mold gets in there. And even though you don't see it, you don't smell it, it can cause enormous damage. And Pornography is like that. You can do it in the privacy of your home, on the computer, but it's it's spiritual black mold. <laughs> it's poison, and it will ruin you. And I know people. I know people in spiritual leadership. I know people on the platforms. I know preachers who have dealt with it and have overcome it. It is possible to be freed from that addiction, but you have to turn to Jesus. And it may be that you need to have somebody... Um, pray over you. I know two preachers right now who were involved in it, and they had to um, go to uh, somebody who really prayed over them and helped release them from that addiction because it is demonic. And, uh, and I believe the demons use that to, to grab a hold on a person's uh, mind, emotions, everything, um, to ruin the person, to destroy them as far as their impact on um, our society at large, but you, you can be set free. Oh my goodness, uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is Lord, then there's freedom. You can be set free from that addiction. Amen. And we're, we're still a ways away from um, a new presidential election. But if we elect a God-fearing president in the next election, will that turn our country around? I pray that we do elect a God-fearing president in the next election because um, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And we desperately need leadership at the very top on down that has God's wisdom, surrounds themselves with God's people um, to strengthen our uh, faith in God. But if, Mike, our nation is under the judgment of God, then um, the solution is not political, and it's not educational, and it's not environmental, and it's not uh, military, that the solution is spiritual. And Isaiah 
cried out. He said, come, let us reason together, though our sins are like scarlet, they can be white as snow. And, and we need to come as a nation, I believe, but let the, let the church lead the way. Can I just say, just call out to pastors and Christian leaders, let the church lead the way to genuine repentance. And if the church would love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, repent of our sin, love our neighbor as ourselves, put the gospel front and center, um, because God loves Democrats, and he loves Republicans, he loves progressives, he loves conservatives, he loves homosexuals, he loves transgenders, he loves uh, wh whoever else you can name, but like the woman caught in adultery, he says, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Because he knows when we repent of our sin and come to the cross that we're cleansed of our sin, we're forgiven, we're reconciled to God, there is freedom, there is blessing, the peace that people are longing for, desperate for, the joy. They're looking for joy in a bottle or in a drug or in a relationship, but that joy is found in a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And we have the answer. But, you know, I'm, I'm just, I want to say, take the muffle off. Take the light out from underneath the bushel. Don't be afraid to stand up and to speak out for the truth with love and grace. You know, one of the things, Mike, I've done is just a, such a small thing. But um, when I've gone out to eat or to dinner and I'm served, you know, at the table, before having the blessing for the meal, uh, even if I'm with a group of people or one other person, I'll just ask the person who's serving me, you know, we're getting ready to pray. Can I pray for you? And I can't tell you how many servers different nationality, different skin color, will stop and say yes and give me something to pray for. And I actually was, the first time, um, not the first time I did that, but not too long ago, um, the guy, sent great big old strong guy, he held out his hands and, and offered me his hands to take as I prayed for him right there. And I was tears in his eyes. And I've only had one person who refused it, which was interesting, and that was recently, and she just said, no, she was fine, she didn't need prayer. But, but just a little thing like that, every time I go out to a doctor's office, and you know, <laughs> with all my cancer follow-ups and other issues I have, I've just, you know, your doctors become your best friends, but, but in the waiting room, and the people around, or the nursing staff, or the doctors themselves, I have opportunities to, to minister to them, to pray with them, to ask God to give me those divine appointments. Uh, my daughters gave me a facial for my birthday and uh, was lying on the table and the little girl was um, from China. And my mother was born and raised in China, so I started a conversation with her and that led me to a presentation of the gospel. And then for 30 minutes as she worked on me, I, I was quiet. But then before I got up off the table, I just took her by the hand and asked her if she wanted to confess her sin and put her trust in Jesus. And standing right there in that spa room, she said yes. So I prayed the prayer and, and she followed me phrase by phrase, confessed her sin, repented, asked Jesus to be her savior, come into her heart. When she finished, she was just glowing, you know, and she got into a good church, a Chinese church in our city. So, so you just don't know because around us, people can put on a facade and they can cover up um, their fear and um, I mean they can see our nation is in chaos they can see the violence and, but they don't know what's going on we do and we know what the answer is and we know that in the middle of it Jesus is still supreme he still reigns the gospel the, the, the cross is still just as powerful as it ever was so um, if I can just say to those who are listening if you're not sure you're right with God, if you would just come by faith in prayer and just tell God you're sorry for your sin, all the wrong things you've done, and goodness, if you're like me, you've done plenty of wrong things, just tell Him. And if you can name Him specific, be specific and, and just tell Him about your jealousy, your bitterness, your pornography, your immorality, your lust, whatever it is. Just He already knows, so you're not going to embarrass Him. That's right. You know, He, he knows. So you just confess it and tell him that you're willing to turn away from it if he'll help you and believe Jesus died on the cross if nobody else needed a savior. You did. 
So just thank him for dying for you and claim his death to make atonement for your sin, just like that coal from the altar, just that, that Jesus would press it against your ears. Would you listen to your eyes? Would you look at your hands? Would you do your feet where you go, your heart, how you feel, your mind, what you think? You know, you just ask him to, to cleanse you with his blood. And, um, and then believe that he rose up from the dead to give you eternal life. And eternal life, Mike, is not only heaven when we die, praise God, it is. This life is not all there is, we're going home. But it also means a personal, right relationship with God right here, right now. And, and so you've received by faith the eternal life that Jesus offers. Open up your heart, means the inmost part of your being. Invite him to come in as your Lord, Jesus will come in, but he comes in in the person of his spirit, his Holy Spirit. He puts his Holy Spirit in you so that actually you're born again into his family. You now have a, a new person living inside of you. Doesn't mean you don't still wrestle with some of the old things, but you now are a new creation. You're a child of God. You belong to him by faith through Jesus. He will give you peace. He will give you joy. He will give you hope for the future. And one day, Oh, praise God, one day he's going to take us out of all this. <laughs> He'll wipe our tears away. There'll be no grief or suffering uh, or pain. And we're going to be home and we're going to live with him forever. So it's an offer you really shouldn't refuse. So I just invite you to put your faith in Jesus now. Well, and, and maybe, Mike, can I just say that what's happening in our nation is it gets worse and worse. And I've been warning for years now it's going to get worse. And I think it's going to get worse. And um, But maybe... God is letting it get that bad, so we will look up. We will turn to Him. We will ask for His mercy. We will repent of our sin. And as a result, maybe, oh, God willing, that He would redeem us, have mercy. Habakkuk says, in wrath, God remembers mercy. So maybe He would have mercy, but, but let it begin right here, right now, with me. Wow. I... Uh... I concur with your father. You uh, you are an amazing preacher, and that was a great sermon. I I'll tell you what, I I totally uh, I totally believe everything that you just said, and I think one of the things that just struck me was just praying with the server at the restaurant. I think that's where the church has been missing it, is that we feel like we're okay, knowing that we have. I've heard it called fire insurance. You know, as long as I'm saved. Then I can just coast yeah. through life. That's not what God has yeah. called us to do. We are here yeah, to be His right. hands and His feet. And I just I pray with you that the church would rise up and say, you know, we're not going to fight, but we're not wavering. And this that's is the right. truth, and we're standing on this that's truth. Right. And as we go through our world, there are people all around us. I you know I, I think of of um, so many books that I've read that talk about the spiritual behind the physical. And how we should be able to mm -hmm. see through that, through the Holy Spirit, to see people's hearts mm -hmm. and how they're hurting and how they're searching for something. And we have the answer, just like That's you right. said, Ann. And I just encourage our, our listeners and those who are watching, um, if you are in the church, let's, let's don't be hypocrites, like so many people have called us over the years. But let's stand firm on God's word and, um, and not waver, because we have the answer. We know that, hey, we know where we're headed. Your parents are there. My father's there. Uh, I'm looking forward to that day, but until then, we have work to do. Yeah, that's right. I was going to ask you if there's any hope for our country. I think you've answered that, and um, uh, so grateful. There's, yeah, there, there's hope. Um, there's hope in Jesus. He's the living hope, and so uh, as if we turn to Him, you know, He, He, we pray He will return to us. But there's also hope for the future, and that. This life is not all there is. This is not my home. I'm a pilgrim passing through. You know, this is wilderness wandering in a sense. And uh, one day we're going to cross the Jordan and we're going to be in the promised land, uh, which is heaven. And again, I'm so grateful. We're going we're gonna to wrap it up because I know that you're trying to save your voice there. I'm so grateful. And I know our listeners and watchers are so grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule to join us and encourage us. Uh, this podcast is all about hope. For those who are in the Lord, who just need encouragement, and for those who don't know the Lord, and uh, they came just to listen to you today, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for your time. Um, I would be honored, and, and by the way, we will put lots of resources from your website on the show notes. Um, I want to make sure that 
all of those resources are available, um, angel ministries and all the things that you do. I'm so grateful for. And, um, but I would love to ask you uh, if you could close us in this episode in prayer. Yeah, yes, I could, I'd be honored to, Mike. Thank you. So, Father God, we bow before you and worship you as the one true living God, the creator of heavens and earth, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we say that we love you, we look to you, we thank you that you have a plan, you have a purpose, and you're working it out. And when the world looks like it's falling apart, we know it's falling into place right at the feet of Jesus. So I pray right now for every follower of Jesus who's listening or watching, that God, you would, within them, set their hearts on fire. Give them a compulsion to speak the truth, to stand up in love for the gospel, to share the peace and hope and joy they have in you in these dark times. Lord, we, ha we have the light, and as the darkness increases around us, then there's more of a contrast. There should be. So I pray that we will take the light out from underneath the bushels where we've hidden it because we're so intimidated. It would lift up the light of the truth, lift up the light of the gospel, lift up the light of Jesus. And so I pray for those even now who are listening who are not followers of Jesus, that right now, with all of their hearts, they would want to be, that they would bow in prayer and just tell you they're sorry for their sin. They want to turn from it. They claim Jesus as their Savior who died just for them on the cross, asking you to forgive them, receiving the eternal life you offer through the resurrection. Oh, God, thank you. Jesus is alive. He's alive. We serve a risen Savior. We receive the eternal life he offers and open up our hearts to invite him to come in because in this day and time, Lord, we're not going to survive without that indwelling power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So I pray that many people who are listening right now will turn to you in faith through Jesus Christ. We pray for the rest of us that you would give us strength and courage, Lord, that comes from being rooted in your word, staying on our knees in prayer, keeping our focus on you, faithful until the day comes when you take us to be with yourself, either through death or at your return. So until then, Lord, we look to you, we love you, and it's our joy to serve you and live our lives to bring you glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And thank you so much. We'll be praying for you to get complete healing. And um, yeah. I hope someday when you get a break, you can come back and join us again. We'd love to have you back. Thank you so much, Mike. It'd be an honor. God bless you. Well, Election Day has come and gone, and we still await decisions in a few states and in our Congress. We know that God is in control whether you are pleased with the election results or not. As Christ followers, we need to be a voice in our nation. One way to do that is by voting. Philosopher Edmund Burke is quoted as saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil. Philosopher Edmund Burke is quoted as saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Now, regardless of Burke's spiritual position, his statement is true. Paul says in Romans 13 that we are to be subject to governing authorities. 1 Timothy 2 reminds us that we are to pray for those in authority and to remain godly and dignified. Ultimately, our authority is God. And Galatians 1.10 says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man... I would not be a servant of Christ. With God as our ultimate authority, we need to pray. Many of us are familiar with 2 Chronicles 7.14, and this should be the center of our prayers. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. As Anne said, there is hope for our nation. It's time for the body of Christ to humbly come before God and repent of our selfishness and our sin and truly seek Him. If healing in our nation comes, it must start with the church. Well, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and come back next week. Before November closes out, we want to recognize November as National Adoption Month. 
To do that, we'll have film writer and producer Stephen Kendrick on the show to talk about his new movie, Life Mark, which will be released on home video on December 13th. Stephen and his brothers are well known for their movies Facing the Giants, Fireproof, Courageous, War Room, and Overcomer. Again, share the podcast with everybody you know, and be sure to check out the video podcasts on our YouTube channel. Just visit BehindTheMic.net. That's BehindTheMic, M-I-K-E, dot net to learn more. Until next week, remember, if your life is grounded in Jesus, even in the darkest times, there is hope. <laughs>